And I'll be kicking things off by talking about imaging of osteomyelitis and septic arthritis. Okay, and I have nothing to disclose. So during this presentation, I just have three questions I hope to answer. First is how do you differentiate between osteomyelitis and reactive marrow changes? Two, what are the most important MRI sequences for diagnosing osteomyelitis? And finally, how do you differentiate between septic arthritis and reactive joint effusion? And we'll start by talking about osteomyelitis. Now, when thinking about osteomyelitis, it helps to think about osteomyelitis in terms of how it spreads. You can have direct spread uh, from a source, or you can have hematogenous spread in the blood. Now, direct spread is most commonly seen in adults, and we typically see it in the feet and diabetics, in the pelvis and people that are bed-bound, such as paraplegics, or in the hands and people with peripheral vascular disease. And it's important to remember that direct spread usually results from an associated adjacent skin ulcer. So always keep that in mind when you're trying to identify direct spread osteomyelitis. Now, hematogenous osteomyelitis is not associated with a skin wound, and it's typically seen in children, usually occurring in the metaphyses of long bones or in the pelvis. Now, when you think about direct spread osteomyelitis, you can think of it as an evolution of the bone's response to the infection, which is characterized early on by bone loss, and that presents as bone demineralization and erosions. And then over time, your, as your body mounts a healing response, you develop sclerosis and periosteal reaction and other bony production. Again, in the acute setting of osteomyelitis, the hallmark is going to be bone demineralization, and when the bone demineralization is extensive enough, you get these poorly corticated erosions like this, and the diagnosis, diagnosis is not difficult to make. However, early on in the demineralization process, the uh, demineralization can be rather subtle, and making the diagnosis can be really challenging on radiographs. You know, where is the osteomyelitis in the patient on the left? It's not clear. Now, this is where MRI can be very useful. Here we have post-contrast enhancement in the um, same patient, we see that there is exuberant enhancement in the second metatarsal head, again, consistent with osteomyelitis. And this brings my first key point when imaging osteomyelitis is just remembering that radiographs have very low sensitivity for diagnosing osteomyelitis in early presentation. Now, um, identifying this enhancement, again, is consistent with osteomyelitis. However, is post-contrast imaging the best MRI sequence for identifying direct spread osteomyelitis? And the answer to that is no. The best sequence you, to identify direct spread osteomyelitis is going to be um, pre-contrast, non-fat suppressed T1 sequence like we see here. Um, as you can see on this T1 sequence, we have complete replacement of the medullary fat with low signal, which has been found to have the best correlation with osteomyelitis on biopsy. So this is the next key point. When you see confluent loss of T1 fat signal, that's going to be the most accurate MRI finding for, again, identifying direct spread osteomyelitis. Now let's compare this patient with the next patient. Here we have another patient presenting with concern for osteomyelitis. They have an ulcer in their forefoot, and we see some soft tissue gas adjacent to the second metatarsal head. There's no findings of osteomyelitis on radiograph. They proceeded to MRI, where we see that there is prominent enhancement within the second metatarsal head. Is this osteomyelitis? And the answer is you should look at your T1 sequence. We go to our pre-contrast, non-fat suppressed T1 sequence, and we see that while there is a little bit of diminished signal within the second metatarsal head, we're not seeing that complete or confluent replacement of the T1 um, fat signal um, appearance. And this is what we call reactive marrow changes. And this is the next key point. Again, when you see increased signal on either a fluid sensitive or post-contrast sequence without this confluent loss of T1 signal, in bone that's adjacent to an ulcer, this is gonna represent reactive marrow changes and not osteomyelitis. And it's important to remember that while this area of reactive marrow changes is not osteomyelitis at time of imaging, it is at increased risk for developing osteomyelitis. So it may require more aggressive conservative management. All right, let's move on to hematogenous spread of osteomyelitis. And again, just like direct spread osteomyelitis, it can be considered as a spectrum or an evolution of your body's response to the infection, where early on, again, the hallmark is gonna be bone demineralization, more commonly osteopenia and less commonly erosions that you see in, in uh, direct spread osteomyelitis. Again, later on in the stage of the infection, you're gonna get bony production, which is gonna be sclerosis and cortical thickening, periosteal reaction. However, in distinction to direct spread osteomyelitis, hematogenous spread of osteomyelitis is much more prone to developing intraosseous abscesses. So in the carotid setting, we'll oftentimes see this kind of mixed lytic and sclerotic appearance like you see in the patient on the right. Now again, just like direct spread osteomyelitis, acute hematogenous 
myelitis is going to have bone demineralization in the early stage, and that bone demineralization can be very subtle, making it radiographically occult. So again, MRI is going to be very helpful in diagnosing acute hematogenous osteomyelitis. It's going to appear very similar to direct spread osteomyelitis by exhibiting areas of um, increased signal on fluid-sensitive sequences with areas of decreased signal on T1 sequence. However, the concept of this reactive marrow changes doesn't apply to hematogenous osteomyelitis. So when you have a patient like this on the right that presents with concern for hematogenous osteomyelitis, and you see areas of increased signal on the fluid-sensitive sequence, that is going to be consistent with, again, osteomyelitis, even in the absence of having confluent loss of T1 fat signal intensity. So again, this is the next key point. In imaging hematogenous osteomyelitis, Fluid sensitive and post contrast sequences are going to be the primary sequences that we use for diagnosis, in distinction to the T1 sequence we use in direct spread. Now, in hematogenous osteomyelitis, there's another sequence that's oftentimes very helpful, and that's going to be diffusion weighted imaging or DWI. Here's the same patient. We have a diffusion weighted image showing increased signal representing restricted diffusion within the proximal tibia, again, consistent with hematogenous osteomyelitis. Now, in this patient, it's not particularly helpful because the findings of osteomyelitis were obvious on T2 and T1 images. However, what about this patient? Here we have a pediatric patient that's presenting with right hip pain, um, fever, and elevated inflammatory markers, and there was concern for right hip septic arthritis and osteomyelitis. They did an MRI, and here we see subtle periosteal reaction along the medial acetabular um, medial acetabulum. However, the marrow is uniformly normal in signal on both T2 and T1 sequences. And it should be noted in this pediatric patient, when I say normal T2 signal, what I see is I see diffusely uniform increased T2 signal owing to the exuberant residual red marrow that's commonly present in pediatric patients. And it's that exuberant residual red marrow that oftentimes can make it difficult to diagnose hematogenous osteomyelitis in pediatric patients. Now, this is where the DWI is gonna be very helpful. We have a diffusion-weighted image here, and we can clearly see that there's increased signal within the right acetabulum in that area of that periosteal edema. This represents restricted diffusion, again, uh, consistent with hematogenous osteomyelitis. This is the next key point, that DWI has a high sensitivity, not specificity, but high sensitivity for identifying hematogenous osteomyelitis, and it can be particularly useful for diagnosing hematogenous osteomyelitis in the setting of residual red marrow, such as in pediatric patients or in imaging of areas of large red marrow like the pelvis. While I'm talking about hematogenous osteomyelitis, I'd like to talk about abscess because again, abscess is commonly seen in the setting of hematogenous osteomyelitis. There's two types of abscesses I want to make you aware of. The first one is what's called a subperiosteal abscess. This abscess is seen almost exclusively in children, typically in the metaphyses of long bones. It's going to look like a fluid collection that's intimately associated with the cortical bone like we see here, and you'll usually be able to appreciate the overlying periosteum. Um, it's important to identify and describe a subperiosteal abscess because this requires more urgent surgical treatment than a typical soft tissue abscess owing to its subperiosteal location. The other type of abscess I'd like to talk about is, again, Brody's abscess, which is an abscess I'm sure most of you are aware of. A Brody's abscess is an intraosseous abscess seen in the subacute to chronic stage of hematogenous osteomyelitis, and it has a pretty characteristic appearance on imaging. On CTs and radiographs, it's going to present as this geographic area of lucency, usually in the metaphysis, which will almost always have some surrounding sclerotic component of the medullary cavity. Now, that sclerosis may be rather subtle on radiographs, but it's almost always apparent as it represents the body's sclerotic response to the underlying infection. On MRI, Brody's abscess, these are going to appear as areas of fluid-like signal with a variable amount of bone marrow and soft tissue edema. And it will oftentimes exhibit what's called the penumbra sign. The penumbra sign is this rim of T1 hyperintensity seen on pre-contrast imaging representing granulation tissue around the abscess. And while it's not pathognomonic for Brody's abscess, it is very suggestive of a intraosseous abscess. Now, finally, I want to kind of finish off osteomyelitis by talking a little bit about chronic osteomyelitis. Chronic osteomyelitis is a great mimicker. It can present in a myriad of ways. 
It can present with uh, just pure sclerosis, like you see here on the patient on the left, where you have medullary and cortical uh, sclerosis. It can present not just with sclerosis, but also with exuberant mass, like periosteal reaction, like you see in the patient in the middle. Or because of these intraosseous abscesses, it can present with this mixed lytic and sclerotic process like you see on the patient on the right. But you'll notice that all of these patients share one thing in common, and that's that it has a sclerotic component to it. And that's true with chronic osteomyelitis, because remember, in chronic infection, you almost always are gonna have a sclerotic component to it as the body's trying to respond to the infection. So the take home key point from this is just remember that chronic osteomyelitis has many faces, and it's a common mimic of tumor. And so always kind of think about it in the back of your head, but remember that if you're going to call something chronic osteomyelitis, it should have a sclerotic component to it. All right, now let's move on for the last couple of minutes and talk about septic arthritis. And we're going to start with a little quiz. You know, we have two patients here that present with a right hip joint effusion, and one of these patients has septic arthritis, the other has a reactive joint effusion from toxic synovitis, and the question is, which is which? Well, they look very similar. Patient, uh, both patients have a moderate hip joint effusion. Patient A does have a little soft tissue inflammation around the hip joint, while patient B does not have any periarticular inflammation. And I would say the bone marrow looks normal in both patients. Patients A marrow looks a little bit increased, but that's just residual red marrow. Well, of course, because I'm showing you these cases, if you're a good test taker, you'll know that the one that looks worse is going to be the benign finding, right? So patient A was the one that had benign toxic synovitis, while patient B had a septic arthritis, even though their only finding was a joint effusion. Well, what's the point in showing you this? It's that Septic arthritis is a clinical diagnosis. It's really difficult to exclude on imaging. I would say we can't really exclude on imaging with one caveat, and that's if you don't have a joint effusion, you don't have a septic joint. But when we image patients, a majority of the time, they're gonna have some joint fluid, particularly when we image larger joints, and we're gonna be stuck where we can't exclude a septic joint. Even though we can't exclude a septic joint, there are definitely findings that can suggest the presence of septic arthritis, and those findings are going to be periarticular fluid collections, severe periarticular edema, and periarticular osteomyelitis. You know, here's a patient that exhibits all of those findings. Here's a shoulder MRI when a patient with suspected septic arthritis. And as we can see, they have periarticular fluid collections, severe periarticular edema and periarticular osteomyelitis. So this patient is at high likelihood of having a septic joint. So how can we take these concepts and apply it in a meaningful way to reporting to clinicians in the setting of septic arthritis, or suspected septic arthritis? Um, well, when you have a joint effusion with, with or without some mild capsular edema, then that should be reported as a nonspecific joint effusion, which may be due to either infectious or non-infectious inflammatory process. However, if you have a joint effusion with any of those previously described findings, juxtarticular osteomyelitis, juxtarticular fluid collections, or exuberant capsular edema, then that is a joint effusion that's concerning for septic arthritis. And I would, just, I would just caution, and while this is concerning for septic arthritis, I'd be careful not to say that it is diagnostic of septic arthritis. And then keep in mind that if you don't have a joint effusion, you don't have a septic joint. So in summary, uh, for direct spread osteomyelitis, remember, the most important sequence is going to be this pre-contrast T1 sequence. And for diagnosing direct spread osteomyelitis, you're looking for that confluent or complete replacement of the normal T1 fat signal. Remember, for reactive marrow changes, that's when we see edema or enhancement without confluent loss of T1 fat signal. And remember that reactive marrow changes means it's not osteomyelitis at the time of uh, imaging. However, it is an area that's at risk for progressing to osteomyelitis on short-term follow-up. For hematogenous osteomyelitis, again, it's the fluid sensitive and the post contrast sequences that are most important because we don't have this concept of reactive marrow changes. So we're not going to rely on our T1 sequence to make the diagnosis. Again, DWI is very sensitive for identifying hematogenous osteomyelitis, but it's not very specific. And because DWI is very sensitive, it can be helpful for drawing your eye to areas of abnormal bone marrow, particularly in patients who have prominent residual red marrow, again, like pediatric patients or imaging of the pelvis. For septic arthritis, again, this is a clinical diagnosis. Why do we even do imaging? We do imaging to look for things like the presence of a joint effusion, to look for social associated extraarticular drainable fluid collections, or to look for the presence of osteomyelitis. And then uh, while there, we can't, oftentimes can't exclude a septic joint on imaging, there are findings that will raise the concern that the joint is infected, and those include periarticular fluid collections, severe periarticular edema, and periarticular osteomyelitis. And there's some references.